I hope everyone's stay, staying safe and taking care. I'm here to give you a behind the scenes look at Trace Together. Um, a bit about me, I enjoy baking and long walks, although now I'm reduced to pacing around my living room every day. Um, I work at the Government Digital Services team, which where we build tech for public good. Um, so some background about contact tracing is useful before I delve into Trace Together. Um, the idea of contact tracing is to identify people who have been in close contact with an infected person and then to contact them to provide early, early detection, right? So they can cut the virus transmission chain. However, there's some limitations here. Number one, you're limited to contacts that a person is acquainted with, um, limited to contacts that a person remembers, and also it's quite have high effort to be tracking down all these contacts and obtaining phone numbers. So what Trace Together does is we supplement the contact tracing process in Singapore and address some of these limitations. The idea is actually quite simple, right? It's using Bluetooth to lock encounters between mobile devices. And now some people, people ask, why Bluetooth, right? There's so many other technologies, um, especially why not GPS? And I think the most important thing is Bluetooth is a bit more effective at determining close physical contact. Um, if you're in a 30-story apartment block, everyone in the building would be within the margin of error for a single GPS point, right? Whereas Bluetooth is really about the people close to you, and the virus ultimately cares about who you're with, not where you are. Um, it also doesn't hurt that Bluetooth uses a bit less battery. Now that sounds cool, but people ask, you know, will the government know who I'm with all the time or will malicious third parties be able to track me? And so that's really at the core of our product, right? How do we architect privacy preserving contact tracing? I'll give you a walkthrough through how the trace together technical journey works. Um, it starts with user registration, right? Where the user signs up just with a phone number and then we generate a random user ID and associate this with the phone number on the server. This is the only thing that the server stores, the user ID and the phone number. Now, now the key question is, what messages should the phones exchange, right? There are some requirements here. Number one, we want to make sure it doesn't re reveal the user's identity. Number two, we want to make sure it doesn't contain static identifiers so that users cannot be tracked over time. Um, most phones today are implement Bluetooth MAC address randomization precisely to prevent this and we don't want to be working against these safeguards. Number three is also to prevent impersonation attacks, right? In Bluetooth, you don't have SSL, and so um, someone can just take the message and rebroadcast it, and you don't want people to be impersonating others because it kind of messes with the data. So what we do is we have the phones exchange this thing called, we call a temporary ID, and you can see the format of the temp ID here. Um, it's actually very simple, right? It's a user ID, which we talked about before, um, with a validity period which is indicated by the start time and end, end time here. Um, these three fields are then encrypted with a secret key that's only held by the health authority. Because it's encrypted, it does not leak user identity. Um, this validity period, the temp IDs are only valid for 15 minutes. And so every 15 minutes, we use, we just, we use a new one that has a different IV. And the IV is kind of like a nonce. That means that every 15 minutes, the phones are broadcasting a different message, right? Which means that they cannot be tracked over time. In order to prevent impersonation attacks, right, the validity period is also useful here because it means that if someone steals your temp ID, right, someone is near you and then he, he or she picks up your temp ID and then wants to, wants to rebroadcast it, the temp ID will only be valid for 15 minutes anyway. And so it's a very limited attack vector. Um, because we encrypt using a secret key held by the health authority, this is all generated on the server. And then we kind of batch it up and then send it down to the device. A common question here is why, why, why are the temp IDs generated on the server as opposed to on the device? You can imagine some public private key cryptography to generate them on the device instead if you give the user ID to the device. Um, and I think the reason for this is there, we, we found limitations in background compute when the app is in the background. So in terms of continuously generating something on the fly, you know, that was something that would hit the com compute limits. Um, next up is if a user is infected, right? Touch root, if somebody gets infected, what happens is they upload their, all their data, encounter data from their device to the server. Um, this consists of the temp IDs, the RSSI, device models, and then the algorithm then filters for close contact. Um, Trace Together is really designed for the Singapore context where we have MOH doing a central manual contact tracing process. And so this data point is something else, another data point that the contact tracers look at when they determine who was likely exposed to the infected person. The Ministry of Health will then follow up and provide any medical guidance and care. Um, this is a peek at the dashboard we use for the contact tracer so that they can determine, right? It's for them to visualize what the app flags are as close contact. 
Um, and I think there were quite a few parts to this architecture, but the whole intent was to ensure we can preserve users' privacy. Um, we don't want to collect, we, we, we have collect very limited user personally identifiable information, right? We only have the phone number on the server that's securely stored by the health authority. We store all the encounter history on the device. Um, and there have been various audits of this and we open source our code. Um, so everything is stored on the device only when the infected person chooses to share it with the health authority, then the health authority will be able to um, see who you've encountered. Um, third parties cannot use the blue trace communications to track users over time. And this is what we talked about, not having a static user ID, uh, a static message that's being sent. And the last thing that we didn't touch on is also being having users in control of their data and being able to withdraw consent and delete data. Because the user ID and mobile number are on the server, it means that if the user requests to not participate and delete their data, we can delete that. And that means that all the TAM IDs that was exchanged with other devices and stored on other devices now becomes useless, right? And so the user can revoke consent. Um, some of the technologies we use, we actually do a lot in Firebase. Um, we do our auth and our uh, we use the cloud functions and it basically powers our mobile app. We use Swift for an iOS app and Kotlin for the Android app. We use native apps because we were going into the Bluetooth technologies and it made more sense to be using the native code. Um, we also use TypeScript and React for the contact tracing dashboard. Um, I'll delve a bit, I'll touch a bit in the, on the technical challenges we faced. Um, I think there are a few groups of them. I want to show you a couple of photos. I think number one was getting Bluetooth to work reliably across different devices. And, and this is a look at part of our device farm, um, which our quality engineer Han Yang manages very tense with care. Like he, he lovingly wipes the screens of all each of these phones every single day. Um, but basically, every device behaves quite differently, especially when it comes to hardware related things like Bluetooth, right? And so we have to end up, they, they optimize for battery differently, the way they send, uh, they send signals at different transmission powers. Um, and so there was a big technical challenge we faced. If you look at this graph, you see that different devices are transmitting at quite different tra different transmission powers. And the RSSI difference, RSSI is receive signal strength. The difference can be up to 20 or 30. And that, because this is a logarithmic scale, it means that it's, you know, 100 or 1,000 times different. Um, so the calibration by device is very important. Um, how do we do that? How do we get this graph? We actually went to an anechoic chamber. Um, a star was kind enough to lend us, uh, allow us to use the anechoic chamber. And basically, it's this like soundproof, Bluetooth proof room so that you can test the transmission powers of devices in a controlled environment. Um, the, the photo on the right is the, um, is the spectrometer we were using. And then we use these, the reference. Uh, calculations we get at these two meter distances, we use that then to calibrate the RSSI uh, that you to receive, which is also why we send the device model when we are exchanging messages with other devices. Another big challenge was running trials and just tuning the algorithm, right? I think at Gov Tech, we were very used to like CI, CD and automated testing, but it's impossible to automate it, to automate the test when your, it's ultimately a lot of Bluetooth, right? You need your devices to be in certain positions um, relative to each other. We, we cannot just run that. I mean, we're very used to just running CICD alternative pipelines, and it was very, we realized that, that that did not work here unless we had, I think now we're starting to explore maybe having device farms where the devices are in fixed positions, um, but that was just not feasible to get set up at the start. And so some of the trials we've been running, so on the left, you see a debug view that we put in the device, right? So when the devices are moving around, they can be tracking, you know, that they're talking to the devices near them. On the right was one of our static controlled trials. We did a few different kinds of trials. This is one of the kinds. It's called a static trial where they see that the devices in different clusters. Here you have three different clusters. Sometimes we put them in bags so that it simulates real life conditions. But basically they're in different clusters and basically you get very good labeled data from this and then you use that to test the algorithm and make sure that um, the system can flag out close contacts as desired. This is a, it's a bit more involved, like human organic trial where basically we give everyone a timetable. We say, okay, um, at this time, you know, can you meet up with this other person? Um, and then we give all that data, data to somebody else who was blind um, to the whole setup. And then let's see whether the, they can predict, the, the, see whether the algorithm can, can predict the close contacts. I think a big, and so, yeah, it was a lot of work for the whole team. Um, but I think ultimately what we do as engineers and designers is nothing compared to what the frontline officers, the frontline medical workers are doing every day. But I think a big thing for us was also the technology, although it's not the solution itself, it can be part of the solution, right? Um, 
you have tons of things that GovTech is working on your uh, GovTech SG, WhatsApp chat, right? Um, the temporary relief form, for, temporary relief fund sign up forms, right? All, there are all these things where technology can be part of the solution to help combat COVID and help also support people, right? As they are dealing with COVID. Um, you can check out our code, as embarrassing as it may be. Um, at github.com slash opentrace slash community. You can also look, read our white paper where we delve a lot into our design considerations um, at bluetrace.io. Now back to you, Janice. Thank you, Joel, for this super insightful sharing. I'm sure a lot of um, the developers will be thinking of, you know, wanting to go and try their hands on this right now. We already have sure, some yes. questions for the event. So, um, sorry, and here's one for you from Shi Chao. So have you guys tried to do silent push notifications to trigger a refresh of the app for iOS? Sure, that's, a, that's actually a really good idea. And we try everything, including silent push notifications. Um, the thing we found is there are different sets of limitations on iOS. It's not just the limitation of background compute. It's also the fact that when the app is in the background, it advertises and scans for Bluetooth in a different way. For example, it advertises in the proprietary way. And so just getting background compute was not enough to overcome the limitations in iOS. Fortunately, Apple and Google are now partnering right on uh, providing a set of Bluetooth contact tracing APIs that will overcome these limitations. Thank you. We actually have a lot of questions on the live chat, but let's see you know, um, what, which one shall we tackle next? OK, here is one regarding Battery Dream. This is by Julie Kiluatutu. Sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong. How's the battery drain when you need to keep connecting between multiple devices and waking the phone at least every 15 minutes? Yeah, this is something we tested rigorously. Actually, we did we did a lot of user testing before we went out. And actually, the number one concern that people had, and we expected it to be privacy, right? The number one concern people had was battery drain. And so we paid a lot of attention to this in our testing. We found that over a whole day's use with many people around you, your battery life is impacted by about 3% on the average phone uh, by trace together. And I think we were quite okay with that trade off. Um, it turns out that Bluetooth low energy, I mean, it's called Bluetooth low energy for a reason, right? The Bluetooth low energy spec, which is the Bluetooth 4.0 spec, is actually you know quite low energy. And so <laughs> it's able to do this scanning and advertising um, in a way that doesn't use too much battery. Okay, so this is from Frank Teo in on YouTube. How do trace yeah. together handle 15 minutes for those who don't have mobile data connectivity, e.g. prepaid card user when they are out from Wi-Fi connection? Yeah, this is something that was not addressed in the first release of the app. And it's feedback that we got from users, especially users who, you know, maybe some soldiers who go out field, right? Things like that. And what we changed the protocol to is we ended up batching these 10 IDs because these 10 IDs are generated on server and send down. But um, and they have a validity period to them, right? But you can kind of batch, forward generate um, 10 IDs for a whole day and send that down to the device at once. Um, and we found that, you know, in Singapore, we found almost everybody gets the data connection, you know, at, at least once a day um, so they address our problems. 